while we are allowing others to join us, we'll take an opportunity to acknowledge those who have chosen to share with us this morning. Let's take an opportunity to acknowledge a member of our Board of Trustees, also State Representative, Mrs. Peblin Warren, would you please stand? Are there any other members of our Board of Trustees present? Okay. We'll also take an opportunity to acknowledge uh, our academic deans. Would you please stand? Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, members of the President's Cabinet, would you please stand? Let's acknowledge them, please. <laughs> members of the Administrative Staff Council, would you please stand? And what about the most outstanding faculty that we can ask? Hmm? Uh, and uh, of course, we take the opportunity to acknowledge the thriving students of Tuskegee University. All of you stand, please. Students, stand. And among those of you who stood, of course, uh, we see those representing uh, our School of Nursing and Allied Health uh, in white. I'm going to ask you to stand again. Thank you so much. Once again, we don't want to take, uh, we want to take the opportunity to acknowledge all of those who have uh, chosen to share with us. Do we have any uh, elected uh, or public officials with us. We've already acknowledged uh, State Representative uh, Pebblin Warren, who's a member of our Board of Trustees. Are there any other uh, elected or appointed public officials? We see uh, Iverson Gandhi uh, there in the back. Are there others? Uh, we invite you to stand or otherwise be acknowledged. Yes. yes. Those of you who are standing on that back row, please make your way to the empty pews. And of course, at a later time in the program, our speaker, our illustrious speaker for the occasion will be introduced. At this time, however, we will call upon uh, the acting president of Tuskegee University, Dr. Ruby L. Perry, who is also dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, to offer words of welcome. Let's uh, give a round of applause to Dr. Perry. Thank you, Dean Gray. Good morning, and welcome to the annual convocation honoring the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In addition to celebrating the life and achievements of Dr. King on his federal holiday, we at Tuskegee University gather this morning to collectively reflect with great gratefulness on his struggles and his sacrifices so that we can enjoy the freedom of equality. Dr. King's legacy is well known to all of us that his leadership contributed to the overall success of the civil rights movement through a nonviolent approach, that he understood the impact of unifying the masses to push for a common goal, that he stressed the importance of having access and achieving a quality education that with courage and commitment, he fought for justice and peace and against inequity and poverty. We take this time to reflect and be thankful for those benefits. Thank you all for coming. I know you're going to enjoy the service because we have a dynamic speaker. And now we'll have the invocation by Dean Gray 
followed by the occasion by Micah Gray. Thank you. Let us stand for the invocation. Let us pray. O most high God, who has created all nations of one blood and destined us to live together as the beloved community, we thank you for the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., charismatic minister, civil rights leader, public intellectual, social reformer, family man, author, Nobel Prize laureate. As his life and work continue to inspire millions of the world over, we thank you for the compassion he demonstrated for the dispossessed, the disenfranchised, the disinherited of society, for his commitment to the cause of freedom, social justice, and equality, for his courageous leadership in the ongoing struggle for truth, a reconciliation, and human dignity, for his powerful vision of what life in this nation and life in this world was meant to be. Not only are we thankful for him, but for all of those nameless, voiceless, faceless human beings who also gave of themselves for the cause. May we here today also resolve to dedicate the remainder of our lives to transforming this nation and this world into that land of promise. In the name of our God, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Mr. Michael Gray. Greetings. I am Michael Gray, and I have the pleasure to serve as the 2019-2020 Student Government Association President. At this time, I would like for all members of the Student Government Association to please stand. Thank you. Today we come together to celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a man with a dream that would change our country for the better. Not only did he stand up for segregation, but he also promoted the idea of peace. Through his caring leadership, Dr. King rallied people from all walks of life and awoke a nation to the need for equality, tolerance, and justice. Dr. King's lasting legacy let us remain mindful of our endeavor to promote diversity, foster inclusive behavior, and demonstrate infinite respect for others. Let's take a moment right now to remember the life of Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. And now let us please stand for the anthem Lift every voice and sing.
you. You may be seated. And now we have a litany of commemoration, Let My People Go, led by Simone Adams and Xavier Bell. Please come forward. Good morning, everyone. I am Simone Amos, Miss Tuskegee University for the 2019-2020 school year. And I am Xavier Bell, serving as the 22nd Mr. Tuskegee for this school year. If the members of the Royal Court would please stand. Thank you. And if everyone else would please stand with us and follow along as we read the litany. In the grand order of the universe, our Lord God wisely has chosen men and women to serve him in each era. Such a servant of our Lord God was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birth we now commemorate. We are thankful for the life of this 20th century prophet of freedom who joined the prophets of history in the cry. And all, in the name of freedom, let my people go. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. envisioned the ultimate freedom, the freedom achieved in the struggle, the freedom reached in brotherhood and sisterhood, the freedom fired by the dream of a man, the freedom inspired by the lot of people, the freedom from hate, the freedom from love, and all in the name of He came into our lives when the yearning of people to be free had turned their attention to justice. For justice, only justice, we shall follow, that we may live and inherit the land that the Lord of our God gives us. All in the name of justice, let my people go. He reminded us that the spirit of humanity soars from the depths and despair with the strength and belief in the promise of the creator of the universe. We know and we testify, the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. All. In the name of the Lord, let my people go. And so he set off with us on a journey for justice. It was a journey proclaiming the words of the ancient prophet Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness, like a mighty stream. It was a journey calling forth the modern Christian ministry to feed the hunger, to cloth the naked, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. All. In the name of all suffering people. The journey went to Montgomery to affirm human dignity and courage, to Birmingham to defeat the sickness separating human life, to Selma to ensure the quality of people and human affairs, to hundred nameless communities to remove the painful shackles of oppression and light joyous torches of liberty. All. When war was encountered, the leader of this journey sang with the people, ain't gonna study war no more. When violence was met, he said, hate is too great a burden to bear. All in the name of peace and love, let my people go. And even when death was confronted, as the journey reached Memphis, he could say in final triumph that in life he had found something worth dying for, something worth life itself, the promised land, a land of justice and freedom. All and we are thankful that the Spirit of the Lord anointed a man who preached good news to the poor, who rejected segregation and embraced liberation, who prophesied the greatness of his people and the struggle for the deliverance of all people. All in the name of the Spirit of the Lord, let my people go. We praise thee, Lord God, for sending us a man of peace who resisted tyranny, a man of nonviolence who fought for liberty, a man of God who worked for the people. Thank you, Lord, for Martin Luther King Jr., who inspired us with his dream, who walked into our lives and our hearts with his marches for justice, we, who demanded freedom with great courage in the face of grave danger, who has now passed on to your promised land. Thank you for his noble legacy to continue the journey to the land here on earth and the life of all people. Thank you, God. You have sent us who now causes us to say all. Thank you. You all may be seated. Oh. 
So Reverend Dr. Raphael G. Warnock's detailed and impressive biographical summary is printed in your program. But I'm just going to emphasize a few highlights. Reverend Dr. Raphael G. Warnock is the senior pastor of Atlanta's historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is the spiritual home of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We could not have chosen a better deliverer of the message to us from a preacher and an educator with a personal connection to Dr. King, whom we are honoring today. Appointed as the fifth senior pastor at the age of 35, Reverend Warnock is the youngest to serve in this pastoral leadership role in the 133-year history of Ebenezer Baptist Church. His call to the ministry received some strong spiritual guidance considering he is the son of two Pentecostal pastors. A cum laude graduate from Morehouse College in 1991 with a BA degree in psychology, he continued his education receiving the Master of Divinity and the PhD degrees from Union Theological Seminary with honors and distinctions. As an opinion leader, his perspectives have been featured on CNN, the CBS Evening News, the Huffington Post, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which hailed him a leader among Atlanta and national clergy, a fitting heir to the mantle once worn by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. What a prestigious honor. On the political landscape, Dr. Warnock has, was invited by President Barack and First Lady Michelle Obama to deliver the closing prayer at the 2013 inaugural prayer service, and he delivered the sermon for the annual White House prayer breakfast in March of 2016. He has received numerous awards, honors, and recognitions, and we are honored to have him today as our annual convocation speaker. And after the anthem, you'll hear the voice of Reverend Dr. Raphael G. Wardock. Let's just give him a warm Tuskegee welcome. Now, if I were at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, after such a beautiful number, I'd say, let the church say amen. amen. That's all right in the chapel, isn't it? Amen. How blessed all of us are to be in this holy place at this time. And how grateful I am for this invitation to stand in this chapel on the campus of the great Tuskegee University. I come as a Morehouse man with profound respect and appreciation for all that Tuskegee has meant and represented and all that you have contributed through your amazing array of alumni all across the country. What would America be from Booker T. Washington to George Washington Carver and beyond? From aeronautics to veterinary medicine, profound appreciation for all the sciences, philosophy, and the humanities. What would America be without Tuskegee University? Give yourselves a round of applause and give God praise for a great cloud of witnesses across the many decades to your president, Dr. Lily McNear, who is a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church. I am certain that she is in all of our hearts in this moment. We hold her and her family up to God in prayer. We're grateful for those who carry on in her absence, among them Dr. Perry, thank you so much for your very kind and generous introduction. I can think of only one other time I received a more generous introduction. The person who was supposed to introduce me didn't show up. And so I had to introduce myself. I'm grateful 
to Dr. Perry and to Dr. Gray, who was on the faculty at Morehouse when I was a student. And um, we're grateful for his witness here in this place across the years to President Gray and to Mr. and Ms. Tuskegee University and to this wonderful choir. For this day, we give God praise. I want to talk for you to you in this moment in our country, this critical and defining moment in which the character of our country and the soul of our nation weighs in the balance. I want to talk to you for just a little while about God's vision for the land. I said I just want to talk to you for a little while. Be mindful when Baptist preachers say they just want to talk for a little while. If you forget you're in chapel and act like you're in church and encourage me a little bit, it'll be a little while. I want to talk about God's vision for the land. In this critical moment, the spirit and the words of Martin Luther King Jr., our great dreamer, our great freedom fighter, continue to inspire us. And he often would quote the prophets of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And one of his favorite passages was taken from the book of Isaiah, and I lift it up again in your hearing. Isaiah says, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. What a grand and noble vision. I call it a moral topography, a spiritual geography that when God's spirit invades our lives, the character and the health of the land itself is changed for the better. Isaiah speaking in the language that only poets and prophets can conjure says every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain made low, the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Hear it again for the first time. Isaiah tells us that if the land is sick, and indeed the land is sick, he says that there is a prescription for progress, there is a path to redemption, and in God's vision, valleys are exalted, and hills and mountains are made low. In other words, in God's vision for the land, First of all, there is equity. Valleys are exalted. Hills and mountains are made low. In other words, in God's order, there is a decided reversal of things. John writing from Patmos, writing the book of Revelation that church folk make entirely too spooky and mysterious. It is but the language of the marginalized and the oppressed speaking to one another as did our African and enslaved ancestors in code language in order to get through the imperial police. John writing from Patmos, which was 
Rome's Rikers Island, Rome's prison industrial complex, speaks about a new heaven and a new earth. And he says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In other words, there is a decided reversal of things when God gets involved in our lives. The high become low and the low become high and that doesn't create a disadvantage, it creates equity. And if you think about our country in this moment, part of our problem is that we are living through a moment in which the high sit very high and the low sit very low. The rich, in other words, are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And when somebody comes by and says that that the high are going to be brought lower and the low are going to be brought higher, that valleys will be exalted and mountains and hills made low. Let us be honest, that doesn't sound like good news to everybody because when you have become accustomed to privilege, whether it be racial privilege or gender privilege or class privilege, when you become accustomed to privilege, equity might sound like oppression. And in a real sense, that's what our current backlash is all about. And there are demagogues sitting in the highest places in our land who are trying to make hay by stirring up people's anxieties, convincing them that their neighbor is their enemy. Meanwhile, they offer the richest folk in the country, those who need it the least, multi-trillion dollar tax cuts. They've been telling us ever since I was a boy, I was a kid when Ronald Reagan was president and they came up with something called trickle-down economics. George Bush rightfully called it voodoo economics. Uh, that, that somehow if you give those who need it the least a tax cut, if you give them all of the wealth, somehow it would trickle down. Well, 40 years have passed by and we're still waiting on it to trickle down. The truth is, if you want to stir the economy, if you want to make it better for everybody, you don't stir the economy by giving rich people more money because when you give them more money, they just give it to their, to their shareholders. But when you give poor people money and middle class people money, they spend it on exorbitant and extreme and and expensive things like food <laughs> and a coat for their kids and medicine. And the prophet says if you want to be better there's got to be some equity in the land. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. We need some equity in the land. And the reason why we can't get any equity in the land is because in America we have criminalized poor people. We have made being poor a crime. And we act like if people are poor, there must be something wrong with them. And whenever you talk about giving working people, struggling families just, just a help, there's all of a sudden this language from people who don't even know what they're talking about, talking about socialism. And too often the truth is we have socialism for the rich and a rugged capitalism for the poor. And don't talk about poor people. Don't malign poor people. Most poor people are children after all. And it's expensive to be poor. Because in all of our states right now, you don't have a living wage. You can't buy, you can't pay your rent in most of our cities on a minimum wage. And then the transportation system is broken and so you can't get from your first job to your second job. Everybody's talking about, presidents bragging about how high the employment rate is. Yes, a whole lot of people have jobs. As a matter of fact, they got two or three jobs. They just can't make ends meet. Can't afford childcare. Don't talk 
and act as if poor people are criminals. I, don't, I know what I'm talking about. I, I was one of those children. Folk like to talk about you having a PhD and occupying Dr. King's pulpit, but I didn't just show up there. It's one of those poor kids. I grew up on the west side of Savannah, Georgia. My mama and daddy, they didn't have a whole lot. There were 12 of us, and we didn't have a whole lot of money, but we had a whole lot of love. We had a whole lot of faith, and we had a lot of humor. And my parents taught me to trust in God. My parents were Pentecostal preachers, and if you know anything about the Pentecostal church, you know they just preached to me all the time in King James English. My mama wouldn't even speak plain English to me. She said, thou shalt wash the dishes. Let lest I smite thee with my rod and my staff. But they convinced me that I, I could succeed. And so I arrived, like some of you students at Tuskegee, I arrived at Morehouse College in the fall. I won't tell you what year because that sounds like an eternity to y'all. And when I arrived that semester, and I'm saying this because some student needs to hear this because our students are struggling. They're having to mortgage their future in order to have a future. And that's wrong. When I arrived on the campus of Morehouse College, Dr. Gray, I, I didn't have enough money for that first semester. I went to Morehouse like some of you on a full faith scholarship. Anybody here on a faith scholarship? And I, when I arrived, the first thing I discovered was that I apparently didn't have enough clothes to go to an HBCU. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the brothers were dressed to the nines. And you ever went to a, a black college football game? It's not just a football game. It's a fashion show. It's a cookout, a barbecue, battle of the bands. And oh, by the way, there's a game going on. What's the score? I don't know. Who are we playing? When I arrived on the campus of Morehouse College, I didn't have enough money for that semester, and I, I saw brothers driving automobiles that I still can't afford. And I turned to my dad, preacher from another time, looking for him to give me some money. My dad spoke to me in King James English. True story, he, he said, silver and gold hath I none from the book of Acts. But such as I have, give I unto thee the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go with you, son. Gave me a great big hug. He and my mama got in the car and drove off into the horizon. Well, four years later, those guys who were driving those fancy cars, they were driving by the stage, but I was standing on the stage getting my degree. I had grit and I had determination, but that alone didn't get me there. Somebody gave me a Pell Grant. Somebody gave me a low interest student loan. Somebody provided for me a path. And I'm angry today because it's harder for children now than it was for me then. We've got to make sure that we give our children a leg up and a path to success. Otherwise, if they're in trouble, all of us are in trouble. Every valley needs to be exalted. Every hill and mountain made low, we need some equity in the land. And then the prophet says that the crooked places shall be made straight and in other words not only do we need some equity we need some integrity. And there are too many crooked places in America right now. Fake news and alternative facts. Crooked places. Lies and then more lies to cover up the lies that you don't think we remember. Those lies are on tape. Crooked places. In Georgia, we witnessed politicians presiding over their own elections, engaged in voter suppression and racial gerrymandering and 
tricks called exact match. It's just a modern day version of the grandfather clause and the poll taxes. We've seen all kinds of tricks to try to steal the voices of brown and black folk. Young people, do you know how hard we had to work? How hard our ancestors had to work? Do you know how much blood was shed so you could vote don't you know that the vote is a sacred thing? Don't let anybody convince you that your vote doesn't count. It must count because they're working mighty hard to keep you from voting. <laughs> Crooked places. Eric Garner had his life choked out of him on a New York City street for selling loose cigarettes. Meanwhile, Wall Street bankers through millions and billions of dollars of mortgage fraud took the, the most valuable thing that most people have and almost sent the whole American economy over a cliff and not one banker went to jail. And that's what you call crooked places. Ray Ray and Shanika and them, you know, pulled up for every small thing. And now we're watching a so-called trial in which the jurors are in cahoots with the defense. And the outcome has already been determined. It is the soul of America that weighs in the balance. And if the people don't stand up and take back our country who in the world will we've got too many crooked places but I'm going to keep on speaking out in whatever places and platforms I have because God told us that the crooked places shall be made straight they won't be made straight unless we straighten them right. Dr. King used to say that the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends toward justice I'm here to tell you that it doesn't bend by yourself by itself we are the ones who must bend the arc so that the crooked places can be made straight and then the prophet says not only that the rough places will be made smooth what an amazing moral topography what an amazing spiritual geography, valleys are exalted, mountains and hills are made low, equity. Crooked places are made straight, integrity. Then he says rough places shall be made smooth. I love that because that's possibility. No matter how rough it seems right now, God knows how to make the rough places smooth. And so I know it's dark, but don't you dare give up. Look at how far we've already come by faith. The things we thought we could not overcome, we, we overcame rough places made smooth. Segregated second-rate schools managed to produce first-rate leaders. Some of you are sitting right here with PhD degrees. Rough places made smooth. They gave us scraps and we made soul food. They gave us the blues and we made music. They gave us the Bible and pointed to Ephesians where it says, slaves obey your masters. Our ancestors could barely read, but somehow they stumbled into Exodus and said, there's another book in here where God told Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Rough places made smooth. And out of that great faith tradition came the black church, and out of the black church came Martin Luther King Jr. He was a genius, but he was not a singular genius. He was a part of a long spiritual tradition. Matter of fact, his father led a voting rights struggle in Atlanta in 1935, 30 years before Martin Luther King Jr. was able to push through the Voting Rights Act. His dad was fighting for voting rights. I'm trying to tell you that you stand on the shoulders of generations that come before you, and you'll pick up the mantle, and you'll continue to work and you'll pass that mantle on to somebody else and if you are doing something if you are obsessed with something a project that you can complete in your lifetime is too small that you're called to be a part of the continuing project of making rough places smooth stony the road we tried bitter the chastening rod felt 
in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat. If not our weary feet come to the place to which our fathers, I want to say our mothers and our fathers, sighed in, in God's moral typography, in God's spiritual geography, there, there is equity, there is integrity, there is possibility. Then finally, he says, all flesh shall see it together. There is inclusivity. All flesh shall see it together. What a great line. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. Dr. Gray, when I read this line, I, I used to think that it meant that because God's glory is so grand, that because God's glory is so magnificent and so sublime that when it shows up, doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you cannot help but see it. All flesh shall see God's glory. That's one way of looking at it. That's all right. But in recent days, I've come to see it differently. I think the prophet is actually teaching us how to see the glory of God. I think the prophet is not saying to us that God's glory is so grand and so powerful that all flesh will have to see it together. I think the prophet is telling us that God's glory is so great and so grand and so magnificent that it takes all flesh in order to see it. That the only way to see God's glory is for us to get together. Men can't understand it without women. White sisters and brothers cannot understand it without black sisters and brothers. That's why someone has said when Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. I wonder what he would have said if his slave had said, me too. But that is the continuing project of all flesh seeing it together. Men thought they understood it until women came up and stood up in the suffrage movement and said, me too. Those of us who are of able bodies, we thought we understood it before sisters and brothers who were differently able stood up through the American Disabilities Act and said, me too, give us access. And that's what I hear our LGBTQ sisters and brothers standing up saying to those of us who are straight and heterosexual that you don't know what it's like to live in my body, to have my experience. And they're standing up in their own way and saying, me too. And before you shut them down, recognize that there are some things you can only see from certain perspectives. It takes all flesh to see what God is up to in the world. We need each other in order to see. And so don't give in to the demons that run rampant in our nation in this moment. Don't give in to hate. Don't give in to xenophobia. Don't give in to bigotry wherever it shows up. It doesn't matter whether it's in a Charleston church or Pittsburgh synagogue or New Haven Mosque, let the, world, let the word go forth that if you attack one of us, you attack all of us because we're all in this thing together. Dr. King said we're tied in a single garment of destiny, caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Don't you know that if they get your sister in the morning, they'll come back and get you tonight? We're in this Together, let me close in this way. I know Baptist preachers usually have two or three closes, but I'm really done. <laughs> Sometimes in this struggle, when I grow tired, worn out by the journey, there's some days I just look up. And because I'm a preacher, I'd love to tell you that when I look up, you know, preachers are sometimes given to hyperbole. I would love to tell you that I see the finger of God writing across the milky deep in Greek and Aramaic. 
But usually all I see is birds flying by. But I like to see geese fly because geese fly in a V formation. And the one that's out front, that's getting all of the sun and the glory and the attention, the one out front that others might be jealous of is actually working the hardest. Because you can't lead where you're not willing to go. But what I like about geese is that every now and then the one out front grows tired. And when he grows tired, he just moves further back in the formation. And she moves up and replaces him. And what I like about geese is that they do that and they keep flying. They do it without a church split. <laughs> they do it without a fight. They do it without a violent revolution. In fact, one side of the geese formation does not decide to shut the whole goose government down. Because geese understand that my individual location is not as important as our collective destination. Good day, Tuskegee University, but run together and fight together and pray together and stay together and study together, we'll see the glory of God together. What a wonderful message that was, as they say, to fill our souls. God's vision for the land. And what I heard, and I hope you heard this as well, is that God has a vision for Tuskegee University as well. There must be equity in the land, which starts with love and respect. I want to thank you for emphasizing that, Reverend Warnock. And it starts with each one of us. It takes all of us collectively. And students, Stay focused, what he said is stay focused and determined to succeed because we as good stewards of this university are here to help you make the crooked places straight and those rough paths smooth. So thank you, preacher, for delivering that dynamic presentation. And at this time, we'll have a spiritual selection by Tuskegee University Choir. Who be a witness for my Lord? Who be a witness for my Lord? Who be a witness for my Lord? Oh, I'll be a witness for my Lord. 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 There was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus, and he didn't believe. The same came to Christ my mind. Was it to be taught out of human sight? Nicodemus was a man who desired to know. So fast, Samson said, Good 
strength will come like a natural man. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson was a witness for my Lord. So is a witness for my Lord. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness for my Lord. My soul is a witness for my Lord. I would like to thank the our dynamic speaker for the hour, Reverend Warnock, the platform participants, the Tuskegee University Choir under the leadership and directorship of Dr. Wayne Barr, our guests and each of you for joining us in celebrating the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King's legacy is an anchor model on which we use to combat inequality today. Let us continue to reflect on how far we've come and not lose sight on how far we still have to go. I leave with you two famous quotes from Dr. King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And the time is always right to do what is right. Let's stay on course to make a difference at this university, in our community, and throughout the world. Again, thank you for coming. Now we have invocation by Dean Gray. Allow me to take the opportunity to say that I'm sure there were many influences in the life of Dr. Warnock at Morehouse College, perhaps far more influential than mine, but there was one thing that I remember about Dr. Warnock as a student of mine. He always arrived early. And when he arrived, he didn't sit in the back of the classroom. He sat in the front row in front of the instructor. And the second thing, and the third thing was that Whenever he opened his mouth, he spoke with depth. It enabled me to recognize, I don't prophesy, but I said, God has his hand on that man. Let's stand for the benediction. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Oh.